Okay, can you? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank the organizers for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to be in Torino um, and give a talk here. And today uh, I want to talk about an uh, ongoing project with uh, Omar Beneria from. See. Yeah. Okay. Um, but an ongoing project with Omar Beneria from Jerusalem. And um, all of the stuff that I'm going to show you is very much work in progress. Uh, so if you have questions or suggestions, feel free to interrupt me and ask uh, uh, questions. OK, so what is the theme of this project? Um, so the basic idea is that we want to talk about theoretic definability to um, look at consequences of strong combinatorial properties of higher cardinals. And um, there's been some work in this on this project and things proven so far, what they show is that if you have like a large cardinal or omega one under large cardinal axioms, you can, for example, show that certain pathological objects are not simply definable. So the same consequences as in descriptive set theory, where when you have a, a nice background theory, something canonical like large cardinals or forcing axioms, then pathological things have no simple definition. And the idea here is that it turns out you can do similar things at higher cardinals, uh, but you have to be a bit careful because these higher cardinals, they have strong combinatorics in common comparison to omega. And these combinatorics can be used to make very complicated objects very simply definable. So you have to, for example, restrict the class of parameters you want to use. Because for example, if you are allowed to use a, a tree as a parameter, then you can code all the kinds of things into the branches of a tree at higher cardinals. And this is very different from, from the classical theory. But if you restrict everything down to, to a, a nice small class, then it turns out that these strong combinatorial properties are actually reflected in the definability uh, at these higher cardinals. Okay, and most of the things done so far, they looked at like large objects that are definable. For example, something like definable well orders of the power set or um, almost disjoint families and so on. So usually large subsets of the power set of the given cardinal. And what I want to show you today uh, concerns like smaller objects, so typically smaller ordinals. Uh, and the idea is that we look at definable closed unbounded subsets of the given cardinal. And here we will focus on large cardinals and singular cardinals, so in particular on singular cardinals of countable cofinality, where club in the classical setting doesn't really make sense because, for example, being stationary just means being co-bounded. But if we go to the definable setting, then things make more sense, and there's actually a nice theory there. And the idea is that we look at the things that have to be, the, the, the ordinals that have to be in all definable clubs, and they tell us something about the combinatorics of the given cardinal. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the central theme of this project. And just to, to uh, give you the, the basic definitions. So we work in the language of set theory, it's just the epsilon relation. And then something is a sigma zero formula, if it's contained in the smallest collection of formulas, it contains the atomic formulas, and it's closed under negation, disjunction, and bounded quantification. Right? So these are just the things you can write down with, with bounded quantification. And then you, we get something more complicated. If we take such a sigma n formula, we negate it, and we add one existential quantifier. So that's the sigma n plus one formula. OK, so that's the. the by there is something in another set. So that's bounded absolute, bounded by epsilon. Okay, so, so this is the, the complexity of formulas. 
And now if we say something is definable, so some class is definable by a formula and certain parameters, means that the class just consists of all elements where the formula holds with these parameters. And now we want to restrict ourselves by restricting the complexity of this formula and the parameters that we use in the definition. And most, in most of the cases, we are interesting, interested in the case where uh, this class is a singleton. So we look at something that's a unique solution of some set theoretic formula. Okay, and now the central definition. So we take some n, so this will be the complexity. We take some uncountable cardinal and some subset of this cardinal. And then for some class of parameters A, we say that this set is sigma and A stationary if it uh, meets every closed unbounded subset of the given cardinal where the singleton of this club is definable in the given way. So by a sigma n formula with parameters in the class, and I also want to allow the cardinal itself as a parameter. Okay, so these are the sigma n a stationary sets. And when, so the idea is we talk about definable clubs. So the stationary sets, they are not definable. They are just there, <laughs> right? But something is sigma n a stationary if it intersects all of these uh, definable clubs. Okay, and then just to uh, make things a little easier. So then we have the light phase version. It's where we have the empty set here. So the only parameter we use is the cardinal itself. Uh, in the bold phase version, we add all small subsets, of, so all elements of H kappa. Uh, and then just bold phase is, so this just bold phase sigma n means elements of H kappa plus kappa itself. So you need one large parameter to make this meaningful, and so you take the smallest large cardinal, uh, large, large parameter, which is kappa itself. Okay, so this is the notion we now want to study. So these sigma n a stationary sets. So you, the set should meet all clubs where the singleton of the club is definable. So the club is a unique solution of a formula of this form. Okay, so first of all, there are such sets because stationary sets, of course, if you meet all clubs, then you meet all definable clubs. Um, but one question is, uh, so if you look at the collection of these definably stationary sets, how much does it differ from the collection of all stationary sets? So in particular, what about cardinals of countable cofinality? So for countable cofinality, uh, stationary just means co-bounded. So in particular, there are no bistationary sets, right? So at uncountable regular cardinals, you have stationary sets where the complement is also stationary, but at countable cofinalities, those things don't exist, right? So what about the, the definable context here? And the other question is, uh, can we develop some sort of non-trivial structure theory for the collection of these um, definably stationary sets? So for stationary sets, we have Fodor's lemma, which talks about regressive functions being constant on a stationary set. Or we have Soloway theorem, which says we can split stationary sets into uh, disjoint stationary sets. Can we do something like this in this setting also? Okay, and this turns out to be a meaningful question. Um, okay, let me give you some observations. So first of all, so this is mostly trivial. So if we are in L and we look at a sigma one and kappa plus stationary uh, sets. So we have sets that meet every club that is definable by a sigma one formula with ordinals less than kappa plus as a parameter. And this is just the same as being stationary. Right, because the the well ordering of L is a good sigma one well ordering, so every club there can be defined by some ordinal less than kappa plus in a sigma one way. So you just say there is an initial segment of L, and in this initial segment, my club is the alphas element. Right. So if I allow enough parameters here, then this definably stationarity is the same as ordinary stationarity. 
Okay, so this is kind of a trivial example, but now something less trivial, which has the same flavor. Uh, so if we assume strong force accents, if we assume Martin's maximum, and now we look at subsets of omega one that are bold phase sigma one stationary, then this is also the same as being stationary. Right, so in this, this is another setting where definable stationary coincides with um, ordinary stationarity. And the reason for this is the result of, of Wooden, which says that Martin's maximum implies something called admissible club guessing, um, which means that every club in omega one contains a set of this form. So these are all countable ordinals uh, where for a given real X, the corresponding uh, stage of the uh, LX hierarchy satisfies kripke platex set series, so where this is X admissible. Um, so for every club, we can find such an X, uh, such that this club is a subset of the given club, but this thing here is sigma one definable from X, right? And omega one as a parameter. So in particular, if you have a bold phase sigma one stationary set, then it will intersect all of these clubs. So it will intersect all clubs. Okay, so these are two examples where being definably stationary is the same as being stationary. But these two things can also differ. Namely, if we restrict the, the size of the parameter set. So in both cases, the parameter set. So here we allow basically real as parameter. So we have Aleph too many parameters. And here we also have Kappa plus many parameters in the first thing. So, so this actually has nothing to do with definability. This is just a counting argument. So if you have something of uncountable cofinality and a parameter set of size at most of cofinality of this cardinal, then there is an unbounded non-stationary set that's uh, sigma and a stationary. And what do you do? You just take all definable clubs, you take their diagonal intersection, you remove the limit points. This will be sigma and a stationary because it meets all of these clubs, but it will not be a club because it's missing its, um, its limit points, right? So if we just say we just want to have cofinality kappa many parameters, then there are a lot of sigma and a stationary sets that are non-stationary with respect to standard uh, stationarity. Okay, so what about countable cofinality? So here, so again, this is really just a counting argument. So remember, for countable cofinality, stationary means co-bounded, right? Because the, the clubs are just basically co-final omega sequences. So, and if you want to meet all of them, you have to contain a tail in the cardinal. Okay, but for the definable sense, so sigma and a stationarity, you will get a stationary set for those complexities where the complement is unbounded. And this is just Koenig's lemma, basically, because Koenig's lemma gives you in here, so these are the countable subsets of kappa. This, this gives you an almost disjoint family in there of size kappa plus. But now, since I said the parameter set has size kappa, there are only kappa many definable clubs. So Koenig's lemma gives us some subset where no subset, this countable thing is definable in the given sense, right? So. And if we take the complement of this thing, this will be stationary because all of the definable clubs live outside of it. So we can find something stationary where the complement is unbounded. So again, an example where uh, definably stationary differs from uh, ordinary stationary. Okay. So this was just like a, the first impression for this thing. So, and now I want to show you that cardinals with strong combinatorial properties, um, there you have a lot of non-stationary sets that are definably stationary. And for this, we introduce something called the undefinability property. 
And what does it say? So we have two cardinals, so something large and something small. And the idea is that you cannot define something in between um, from the large, larger cardinal as a parameter and small parameters. And so the kind of the, 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 the test question is say, okay, so you want to define omega one, the first uncountable ordinal. And you want to define it, so you can define it from omega two as a parameter in a sigma one way, because you could say, okay, there's a model of set theory that's transitive and it computes omega two correctly, then it also computes omega one correctly, right? Because uh, there are not that many cardinals <laughs> below it. Okay, so what about uh, omega omega, the first limit cardinal? Can you define omega one from omega omega in a sigma one way? And uh, that's the motivation for this, because it turns out in certain settings you cannot, right? Because you have infinitely many thing, cardinals below, and then you cannot do this trick to say, okay, this is omega omega, this has to be omega one. Okay, so this would be the question, does omega omega have the omega one undefinability property? Okay, so where you can define it from omega omega, and reals as parameter. Okay, so you say that this larger cardinal kappa has the sigma one mu undefinability property. If nothing in this interval, including mu up to kappa, uh, is definable by a sigma one formula with parameters in H mu, so small parameter, parameters are allowed, and the larger cardinal as a parameter is allowed. And once you have this, uh, you know that this cardinal mu has to be an element of every club that's definable from kappa and elements of H mu in the sigma one way. Yeah, so when you have this property, this cardinal has to be in all those definable clubs, um, which is a rather strong property because you can force a cardinal to be in these definable things. So in particular, uh, this is a direct consequence of this. If you have a cardinal kappa where there's an unbounded set of smaller cardinals for which it has this undefinability property, then uh, this unbounded set will be stationary in kappa. Yeah? And the, the way we will use this later on is that we will show that in omega omega, the set of omega n's is stationary for sigma one definitions. Yeah, I mean, aleph omega for me is the cardinality and omega omega is the, yeah, yeah. So this will show that even at countable cofinalities, these definably stationary sets have a non-trivial structure theory. Okay, and let me, quickly show you how to prove this because this is kind of uh, the idea behind this thing. So we have this, this statement that if we have this undefinability property, which means that nothing in the interval between mu and kappa can be defined by sigma n formula, then this is stationary. Um, okay, so let's take a club. That's uh, the unique solution of a sigma n formula using small parameters and the cardinal kappa itself. So, and now let's assume that uh, this mu is not in there. So this will be the contradiction that mu has to be in there. Then we can take the minimal element above, uh, above mu and let's see. Um, and there has to be something in the club below mu because otherwise we can define this thing here, right? Because otherwise it's a minimal element of the club and that's definable if the club is definable and it's something in this interval where nothing definable should exist. Okay, so um, let's see. But now, we can take the largest element in the club below mu, and this has to be strictly smaller than mu because mu is not in the club. 
Okay, but then the first thing above mu is definable from the club and this parameter, right? Because it's the first point in the club uh, above this maximum here. And now we find a, a sigma one definition of this thing nu here. And the only thing I used in this parameter is this ordinal here, which is smaller than mu, so I'm allowed to use it. And the club is also definable. OK, and that's a contradiction, because this is something in this forbidden interval where nothing is definable. Okay? And this, this is the idea how this undefinability works, that um, you can go into this forbidden intervals and define something there. OK, so why is this undefinability property interesting? Because large cardinals have it. Um, so if I have a measurable cardinal, then it has the sigma 1 mu undefinability for all smaller uncountable cardinals. Um, and I will, I mean, I don't know how much of the audience <laughs> uh, understand this proof, but I will give you the argument for this. So what you do is, so you take your sigma 1 formula that defines something from a, so it defines something, some ordinal in this interval between mu and kappa from a small parameter. And it's a unique solution of this sigma 1 formula. And then you take a, a so, small substructure of H kappa plus, um, and it has cardinality less than mu, but it contains the transitive closure of the parameter. So we can take the, the transitive collapse, and this will map the parameter to itself because I included the, the transitive closure, but it, it maps the ordinal I defined to something smaller, right? Because this ordinal has size um, smaller than the size of the substructure. Okay, but now I started at a measurable cardinal, so I get this normal ultra filter, and I can look at the image of the filter under this collapse, and then it's an external filter for the for the collapse. And uh, it's the the structure with this filter will be iterable. So that's a basic fact about um, measurable cardinals. So this means that I can now take the small structure and turn it into something big again, right? Because I can do an iteration of length kappa. So what I get is some larger transitive structure n and an elementary embedding of the small thing to n, where I send uh, the, the image of kappa under the collapse back to kappa. So because this, this image here, this is where the filter lives, right? And then it will be the critical point of this uh, iteration. But below this, the image of kappa, this embedding will be uh, the identity, right? And so it's a, because it's a critical point. But what this means is that this thing here will be fixed by the embedding. Oops, sorry. So this means in this final model N, the formula I started with will hold with this first, the image of alpha under the collapse, because this is not moved by the iteration. And here I have kappa because I collapsed kappa and then I iterated it up again. And the parameter will be also fixed by both maps. Okay, but this is now a sigma one statement and sigma one statements are upwards absolute. So it does not only hold in N, but it holds uh, in V. So I now found a second ordinal that satisfies this definition and I got a contradiction. Okay, so the idea is you um, you take some structure where the sigma one statement holds, you collapse it to something small, you iterate it up again, and then you you get a, a second solution to your formula, and that's a contradiction. Okay, so large cardinals have this undefinability property, and you can actually uh, do this with much less than a measurable cardinal. Um, and 
maybe you don't really have to read this definition. So these are these cardinals are called stably measurable. They were introduced by Philip Welch. And if you look at the definition, it's really just everything you need to do to run this argument that I just showed you. Right? Then you can take this as a definition that the previous uh, proof works. Right? This is really just what this definition says. And you can actually, so if you spend more time on this, then you would see that the same argument um, really gives you the same conclusion. Okay, so stably measurable cardinals have this undefinability property for all smaller cardinals. And these things, they, um, they are right above the existence of sharp for reals and below a Ramsey cardinal. So much smaller than a measurable cardinal. Okay, but now it turns out that, uh, uh, yeah, so at these stably measurable cardinals, this sigma, this bold phase sigma one stationary sets, they have a very nice structure, which is very different from the uh, ordinary stationary, uh, the collection of ordinary stationary sets, because what I've just showed you implies that all unbounded sets of cardinals are sigma one stationary. So there are a lot of non-stationary sets that are sigma one stationary. Okay, but in the other direction, this is still a non-trivial um, collection because uh, you can prove Fodor's lemma for it if you just restrict yourself to sigma one definable regressive functions. Okay, so if you, you have a sigma one stationary set and you have a regressive function that's sigma one definable in the same way, then it, it's constant uh, on a sigma one stationary subset. And um, this is not trivial. So for, to prove this, you basically have to show how all of the definable clubs look like in the setting. And what you prove is that the definable clubs are really just the, the iterates of these small models. So you have a small model where the definition of the club holds and you iterate it up to uh, kappa again. Okay, and this will kind of be the, what we want to show for other cardinals, these two things that unbounded sets of cardinals are definably stationary, but we can prove something like Fodor's lemma, so this collection is non-trivial. And this proof this for inaccessible cardinals. So inaccessible cardinals that have these two properties are basically the stably measurable cardinals. Okay, and why is this true? So we can do two things. So first of all, if you go to the dot Jensen core model, so a canonical LR model that's slightly larger than L, so it can have large cardinals below a measurable cardinal. So in this model, uh, the stably measurable cardinals are exactly those cardinals where the unbounded sets of cardinals are sigma one stationary, right? So this definably stationarity property, it characterizes stably measurable cardinals in the dot Jensen core model. So in some canonical inner model. So this is one reason why there's a direct correspondence. And the other one is that it's the stably measurable cardinals, the existence of such a cardinal is the consistency strength of an inaccessible cardinal with this property that unbounded sets of cardinals are sigma one stationary. Right, so there's like three reasons why stably measurable cardinals directly correspond to inaccessible cardinals with this definably stationary property. Yeah, so you have a direct um, uh, equivalence in canonical in our models and the consistency strength is exactly the stably measurable cardinal. Okay, and now the next step is, um, to look at other cardinals. And there it turns out that if you now, instead of taking iterations of small models, you look at iterations of V, you can get the same things, but for limits of measurable cardinals. And now this includes singular cardinals. So at singular limits of measurable cardinals, you also get these nice structural results. So let me, so this is now almost the same thing, but we have a slightly larger definability class and the, the cardinals now can be singular, right? So at limits of measurables, 
every unbounded subset consisting of cardinals is stationary. Now for sigma one definable things where I use ordinals and bounded subsets as parameters, and we get Photos lemma for things definable in this way. Um, okay, so now the next thing we want to look at is singular cardinals, in particular singular cardinals of countable cofinality. And this already gives us an example where um, they have a the definable stationary sets have a rich structure where the station, the ordinary stationary sets just have a trivial structure because it's just co-boundedness. Um, so we want to show that some large cardinals are have to be involved there, and we need something from the dot Jensen core model. Uh, so this is now just the technical reason for the things that come next is that. Uh, if you take an arbitrary cardinal um, and you look at its cofinality in the core model and you look at the, the least cofinal function from the cofinality to the cardinal, then both of these things are sigma one definable, just using the parameter kappa. And this is because the, this core model has a simple structure. And why is this useful? Well, if there are no large cardinals in inner models, if there's no measurable cardinal in an inner model, then singular cardinals will be singular in the core model. So I can define their cofinality um, in a sigma one way. Uh, so all of this core model stuff, it's, I don't know, 40, 50 years old. And I think people actually working in inner model fields are not me. They think it's all trivial, but for this kind of question is actually the right techniques because you you need some simply definable in a model and the, the dot Jensen core model, it has simple definitions. So this is basically what this is saying that the structure of the model is kind of close to the structure of L in terms of complexity. Okay, so now what can we do? So now we want to show without in our models with measurable cardinals. Um, at singular cardinals, this definably stationarity behaves badly. Okay, so, so assume there's no inner model with a measurable cardinal and we have a singular cardinal. So then this one conclusion that I said that every unbounded subset uh, consisting of cardinals um, is stationary, so this fails, right? So, and the counter example would be the, the smaller cardinals that are successors of singular cardinals. So this will not be stationary in this setting. What else fails? There is a regressive function that's not constant on an unbounded subset. So this can also fail without large cardinals in inner models. And the last one is that if we are at countable cofinalities, then there are no bistationary sets in the um, definable context, which means that every sigma one stationary set, it actually contains a club. Okay, but we already saw that with large cardinals, uh, we, can, we can have all of these things that fail without large cardinals. And what's just missing is that we can get it from a singular, single measurable cardinal. So now this is the same thing as before. So again, these nice two properties, unbounded sets of cardinals are sigma one stationary and we have photos lemma for sigma one function, but we also have it if we just do prick reforcing with a single measurable cardinal. Yeah, so there the, the, we have strong combinatorics and um, uh, these strong combinatorics give us this rich structure theory for, for the definably stationary sets. Okay, and this is now just a, a summary. So we get a lot of equiconsistencies this way with a measurable cardinal. So the existence of a measurable cardinal is equiconsistent to a singular cardinal where these unbounded sets of smaller cardinals are sigma one stationary. It's also equiconsistent with a singular cardinal where the definably regressive functions are uh, constant on unbounded sets. 
so you can replace unbounded by um, sigma one stationary there. And it's also uh, equiconsistent to the existence of a singular cardinal of counter cofinality, where we have a, a bistationary set in the definable context. Yeah, so these are all equiconsistent with the measurable cardinal. Okay, and now what I want to show you next is actually the the motivation for all of these, and these are partition properties of small singular cardinals. And so again, I'm not sure if you, I guess if you see this for the first time, it won't really help to say the, the definition, but I want to look at um, Ramsey type properties of, of cardinals that might not imply that the cardinal is a large cardinal. And uh, one of the main, main uh, examples of this are Roboton cardinals. And what's their definition? So we use this square bracket partition relation to define them. So something is mu Roboton if this thing here holds, and what does it mean? So you look at colorings, you color the finite subsets of some cardinal kappa with lambda many colors. And then you, you find a large set that's now homogeneous in the sense that you omit a lot of colors. So when you just look at the, the colors that the final subset of this thing gets, it's less than mu many. So this is mu row bottom and row bottom is the aleph one row bottom. And that's equivalent to some Shanks conjecture type thing where you have a structure of size kappa, you have some predicate of size lambda, and you get a sub elementary substructure of size kappa where the predicate has size less than mu. Okay, and how is this connected to, um, to this topic? So first of all, I think one of the, the big the famous open question in set theory is whether Aleph Omega can be row bottom. Um, and this is not known. So, so row bottom cardinals, they have large, their existence have large cardinal strengths. So it's a, it's a Ramsey cardinal. Um, but the property itself does not imply an accessibility. So limits of measurable cardinals are row bottom, and it's not clear how small row bottom cardinals can be. But, uh, but what is now a connected thing to the, the theme of this talk is that if the first limit cardinal, omega omega, if this is omega n row bottom uh, for some n bigger than uh, zero, then uh, omega omega has this undefinability property. Yes, so in particular, we get these stationary sets. Um, and the way you prove this is that this being row bottom, it gives you an elementary embedding from some transitive structure containing Aleph omega into, um, say, H. Aleph omega plus one, uh, and the, the embedding it fixes omega omega, it moves its critical point to omega n, and it fixes stuff below. So in this undefinability property, remember that we have the parameters we used were the cardinal and something small. And if you take these embeddings given by robotomness, they will fix those two things. Right, but they will move omega n. So you cannot define omega n from this, from the large thing and the small thing because it's it's moved by the embedding. So that's kind of this observation that motivates most of the work uh, showing you here. And once we have this, we can like look at maybe an even more famous question. So the question whether Aleph Omega can be Jonsson. So Jonsson cardinals, it's, it's slightly weaker. So they have the property that whenever I have something called an algebra on kappa, so we have a function that sends 
finite subset uh, of kappa to kappa. And Jonsson is, gives us a proper subset of size kappa that's closed under this function. Uh, and the, the main example of such, of such a thing is something that gives you scolem functions, right? So this is the same as saying, if I have a, a countable first order language and I have a structure of size kappa, then I get a proper substructure that also has size kappa, elementary substructure, right? Because you can just code scolem functions here. Okay, and the more famous question than the robotomness of Aleph Omega is if it can be Jonsson. Although you can show that if you can prove the consistency of one, you get the consistency of the other. So their solution would be equally consistent. And uh, this is open for a long time. But what we can do is that we can show some consequences of this. So if Omega Omega is Janssen, then we get these type of conclusions that we looked at, that we had, have had large cardinals and that limit of large cardinals. So again, like, unbounded subsets consisting of cardinals, they are sigma one stationary, and we again get this photo type uh, thing. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is a common theme that you look at large cardinal properties or fragments of these, of these properties that can hold at smaller cardinals. And this is an example of this. Okay, um, so, the end of the talk, I will show you that these consequences do not characterize the Janssenness of Aleph Omega. Uh, but what we can do is we can restrict the class of models where uh, Aleph Omega has strong partition properties. Um, or at least we have some examples in this direction. Okay, so for example, we can show that um, in the standard model, of strong forcing axioms. So where you take a model of GCH with a supercompact cardinal and you do forcing, you turn the supercompact cardinal into omega two and you have some forcing axiom. There in these models, um, omega omega will not be omega two row bottom. Um, and the proof is not that hard and it uses definability. I think you can also prove it in another way, but I think the argument I'm gonna show you is nice. Um, oops. So, because what we have is, so fix some, some number m bigger than one and assume that at omega m, there are no special Arenstein trees. Yeah, so, so special Arenstein trees are Arenstein trees where you have the specialization function where um, that's um, injective on branches and it goes to the predecessor. So it gives you a concrete reason why the tree has no branch. So at omega m, there are no special Arnstein trees, but at all larger omega n, there are special Arnstein trees. And the example where this holds is, say, under PFA, where GCH holds above omega 1. Right, so PFA gives you the tree property at omega two, and GCH above this gives you special Arnstein trees at all other omega ends. That's due to Specker, I think, that you get special Arnstein trees from uh, from GCH. Okay, so you you have this uh, in the standard models of forcing axioms for m equals two, and in this setting. Uh, Singleton omega m is definable from omega omega. So in particular, uh, omega omega will not be omega m row bottom because row bottomness gives you this undefinability property. Okay, so, uh, so m is the place where you have no special Arnstein trees and n and the, the, the ends should be the larger ones where you have orange entries. And I guess in the conclusion, there should be no N, right? Yeah. Wait, what do we do? There is an N bigger than one such that- Before all N, so, so, so you, you fix M. So M is the place where you have no orange entries. Yeah, but I mean, there are <laughs> quantification of that. First, they, 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 there is a natural number N 
No, no, here the quantification goes over n, sure. sorry. Ah, okay, sorry. So this is just the interval above okay. m too. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, this might no, not I, be the I, best. Yeah. Okay, so in this setting here for when you force PFA over a model of GCH, uh, omega 2 will be sigma 1 defined from omega omega. Um, okay, and the way you prove this, maybe I can now use the blackboard, <laughs> is you say, okay, so the sigma 1 definition is you say there is some transitive model M of some large enough fragment of ZFC. Um, and this model computes omega omega correctly because I can use this as a parameter, right? So I can say, and this model has, so it has its own omega two. And I say, okay, above omega two, it has special orange entries at all cardinals. Okay, there is such a model M because I can just take uh, H Aleph omega plus one because this, oh, I, I should use M here, sorry. Yeah, uh, so because this is just my assumption that this pattern holds in V. Okay, so there is such a model M. And now I claim that the omega m of this model is a real omega m. So this gives me a sigma one definition because I say there is a transitive model which has these trees and its omega m is the thing I want to define. Okay, so why is this true? Okay, look at v. Okay, so I use this as a parameter. So this, this uh, omega omega of this model is a real omega omega. Um, okay, but now I look at the real omega m. Okay, and assume it's larger than this one. I mean, it cannot be smaller, right? Because there are only finitely many cardinals and all of the cardinals in V are cardinals in here. So it could be larger, uh, but then it's a cardinal in here. So this model has a special orange entry here. But being a special orange entry is upwards absolute because it just said there is a specialization function, right? So this model here gives me a special orange entry in the real world, which doesn't exist by assumption. Okay, so this model here computes omega m correctly, and this gives me a, a sigma one definition of omega m. Okay, yeah, so this is just an example how you can use these kind of ideas to say, okay, in, in these models here, in these standard models of forcing action, this famous question has a negative answer. Um, so it was known before that forcing actions do not imply the Johnsonness of Aleph Omega, but this was just, um, you forced over a model of PFA and uh, just created one model. So this is uh, a more general assumption. Okay, so what else? Um, okay, so now the last thing I want to show you is just the statement that this consequence of the Johnsonness of Aleph Omega, does, it does not um, uh, characterize the Johnsonness of Aleph Omega. So you can get the conclusion I just told you already from a measurable cardinal. So this um, is a statement that all of this smaller, so omega omega has this undefinability for all smaller omega n's. So in particular, every infinite subset of the omega n's is sigma one stationary. I have this statement about regressive functions and the existence of a definably bistationary sets. So these are all consequences of the, the Johnsonness, but I already get this from a measurable cardinal. And the way you get this is you do, you start with a measurable cardinal, you do prick reforcing. So this gives you this final omega sequence, and then you just collapse everything in between the cardinals to turn the measurable cardinal into omega omega. 
and then you just I mean it takes some some work, but you you get these consequences there. Okay, but I think still think that the, it's a, like a new way of attacking this problem whether Aleph Omega can be Janssen and just look at the definable consequences. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Is there a way to kind of like call me on it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. Let's see. So I think it, it already gets complicated at limits of measurables. Um, because I mean, if you just have finitely many measurable cardinals, you can use those things as a parameter. So because it's something small and bounded, but um, I think it's one thing that's problematic is that you have to use the places where the infinitely measures live as a parameter to still get it in a sigma one way. Because if you look at like the uh, the slightly more complicated core models like the Mitchell model or whatever there is in the definition there are universal quantifiers because you have to look at like partial measures and say okay do they extend to full measures at some point or uh, so on so they are it's it's not really clear um, if you can get rid of these things <laughs> um, so I, so at least for sigma one definability like being a limit of measurables is, is problematic and being a measurable limit of measurables is even more problematic. <laughs> so uh, it stops way below a wooden cardinal, these kinds of arguments. And um, I think maybe for like limit of measurables, you could do something more clever than I showed you. I'm not sure if it's possible, but I think at some point the core models will be sigma two definable and not Sigma one definable, um, and this might happen way below a modern cardinal. Um, 